Corinthians had been designated by scholars and theologians uh, as the severe letter. Uh, Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthian church while under great distress and anguish of his heart. He was writing it when his spirit was extremely low. And Paul's apostleship has come under attack by the Jewish Christian missionaries. His integrity had been questioned. Are you praying with me, brothers? His character has been assassinated. All right. All right. His ministry seems of little, uh, if any, significance. Uh -huh. And Paul decided that he better speak to the issue. Yeah. All right. So Paul tells the Corinthians that he's not writing that they might be angry or grieved, but because he wants them to know the love that he has for them. Yeah. Thank you. If you are like I am, you and I can, can both identify with Paul because the same thing has happened to us or we have been close to a similar situation. Someone has misunderstood our intentions. Uh, our integrity has come some time into question. We have been brutalized. Uh, there have been times we have been scandalized and called everything but a child of God. Even though we have tried to do the best that we could, our best was not good enough. But let us now look at the situation in the Corinthian church. The Jewish Christian missionary uh, has entered the church at Corinth. They had caused an undercurrent in the church. Uh, these teachers had come from the outside. Oh, you're not going to pray with them. They came presenting their long list of impressive credentials of places where they had visited as well of places where they had preached. They had teaching credentials from the best schools. They were boastful and arrogant. They, they liked to sing their own praises and boast about what they had done and how much they had and who they knew. I know it don't sound like nobody in this crowd. They were impressed totally with themselves. Their position was not one of a suffering servant, but of one who wanted to be served. They felt it's the obligation of the church to support them. Oh, I wish you'd pray for me. But these individuals were flashy in their attire. Uh, statuous in body and their words could calm the savage beast. Yes, they were cool, calm, and collective. Uh, they were extremely cunning and conniving. They were false prophets who, who stressed the law rather than grace. Uh, maybe we can understand what Paul was up against. Paul writes then to the Corinthians, I understand your misunderstanding. Do you hear what I'm talking about? I did not come to you with the eloquence of speech, nor did I try to deceive you in any way. He said, uh, I did not try to offer you cheap grace, telling you that you can lose with the stuff I use. I did not try to make you believe that my bodily presence was an indication of my spiritual strength. I can't understand how someone could influence your thinking towards me in a negative way, especially when it appears to be new and a different doctrine with more flair than I present to you. I do not have a counter defense. I do not offer you anything new or anything old or anything different. He simply says, this is the same old, old story. Uh, what I say to you in reference to the gospel 
still stands. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's the same today and forevermore. I still preach only Jesus Christ crucified. I know nothing else. For what I preach is not myself, but Jesus Christ. I will tell you, though, you the source of my strength. However, I will tell you what keeps me going in face of adversities, despite trials and tribulations. I wonder if I had a witness. I will tell you what keeps me going when it seems like I don't have a friend in the world. You need to know my thoughts when I have to stand alone, although I know I would have others to help me in the words of an old Negro spiritual. I was way down yonder by myself, and I couldn't hear nobody pray. I want you to understand, Second National, that it's God's way to use imperfect vessels for the conveyance of the gospel. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Oh, I wish I had a prayer prayer. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. An earthen vessel is a thing of little or no value of worth. It's made of clay. And if you want to get real nice to it, it's just simply made of dirt. Uh, the treasure is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without the treasure, we would be full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I wonder if I can get a witness. You see, all of you in here ain't nothing but nothing. You're nothing but a clay. You're nothing but dirt. And if it had not been for the law that takes on the residence in your body, you could not be what you think you are. And you have a treasure in a vessel. You have a treasure in this jar of clay. I wonder if I can get a witness. Paul says that ministers or servants are weak and frail creatures, subject to like passions and infirmities as others. I want everybody in here to understand that we are not supermen. Uh, we are not superstars. We are just dirty people trying to make heaven our home. They are mortal and soon will be broken into pieces. Uh, God has to order that the weaker the vessel, the stronger God's power may appear to be. Do you hear what I'm talking about? Just because a man gets up in age doesn't necessarily mean that God can't work through it. Just because you're not well doesn't mean God can't do something for you. Uh, God says, I can use the weaker vessel, and there he'll get more power to do greater things in my kingdom. I wonder if I can get a witness. Uh, that the treasure itself should be valued all the more. Now, let me tell you what I'm trying to say. Don't worry about church, who you got in the pulpit. Worry about what's inside his heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like clay, God can mold us, shape us, twist us, and turn us on. You know, some folks say, well, you know, I, I would go to that church, but it don't look like much. I wonder if I can get a witness. Uh, he doesn't dress the way I want him to dress. He doesn't speak with eloquent speech like the way I like for him to speak. But I'm here to tell you that if you sing this song, have thine own way, Lord. Jesus, that he laid down his life and just got up 
some money and that he got inside of TJ. Yeah. And he took what was empty clay and empty jar and filled me with his treasure. Yeah. And, and, and when he fills you, he gives you courage to run and not be weary. Yeah. When the treasure's inside of you, he can make you walk and not think. Yeah. In spite of what you come up against, it makes a difference. Yeah. Oh, what a difference Jesus makes when he's in your life. What a difference he can make in anybody's treasure. He can make a difference if you are just nothing but dirty dirt. I love this story and I got to tell it today. The story is told of an estate auction where some of the finest china, linen, and furniture and other items of great value were being sold. And all of the items sold rapidly. But at the end of the auction, the auctioneer remembered an old dusty violin in the corner. Oh, you're not going to pay with me. The auctioneer remembered an old dusty violin in the corner. The auctioneer picked up the old violin. And the people began to laugh at, at, at such an out of place object in their presence. Amen. You see, I mean, then the auctioneer opened the bid. Yes, uh, he asked, What is the bid? Somebody said, I'll give you $2. All right. Somebody else said, I'll give you $10. Right. Still another said, I'll take it off your hand for $50. Oh, you're not going to pray for me. The auctioneer was getting ready to close the bid with the $50. Just then, an elderly man, oh, you're not going to pray for me, said he got up from the back of the church, walked slowly to the front, and asked the auctioneer, said, if you don't mind, let me look at the violin. So he took it from his pocket of the cloth, and he began to rub the instrument. Do I have a praying church? So as he began to rub the instrument, a shine began to come through. He rubbed it again, and the more he rubbed it, the more magnificent uh, the green of the wood shined through on this fine instrument. He then began to pluck the strings. Oh, you're not going to pick with me. And he turned the pegs to tune it just a little bit. He placed the instrument in position. Do I get a witness here? And, and turned the peg just one more time to make sure he had it properly tuned. Yeah. Uh, he began to play a familiar tune to everybody. Yeah. It says, Amazing Grace, hey. how sweet the sound. Yeah. They sing the wretch like me. Yeah. I, I once was lost, yeah. but now I'm found. Yeah. When he finished playing, he said, The old man gave the violin back to the auctioneer. Yeah. Slowly began to walk back to his seat. Uh, there was not a dry eye in the place. I wonder if I got a witness. Finally, the auctioneer composed himself and responded to the bidding. What is the bid for this beautiful violin? Somebody bid it $5,000. Oh, you're not going to pray with me. Another bid, $20,000. Another bid came up with $100,000. And then the violin sold that day for $200,000. Look me. 
beyond teaching and saw me as an empty vessel and filled my soul with his love one Friday evening. I'm not worried about what life holds for me. I got my heart fixed, my mind made up. Paul knew something that I want to leave with you. Paul knew that the Lord was his life and his salvation. He stretched to the Corinth church the importance of having this treasure and realizing its source. Children of God are great sufferers. They need to have courage and patience under all suffering. Christ said in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. According to the word, Paul says we are trouble on every side. Oh, you're not going to pray with me. Uh, not one side, not just on my left side, not necessarily on my right side. He said, but you're trouble on all sides. We meet all sorts of trouble daily. Look like the more we try to do right, the more trouble we encounter. What if I get a witness? Yet, he says, we are not distressed. We are not counted out. We are not down. But we keep getting up. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, we have a friend in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. We can see help come from God and in God. We take it to the Lord in prayer. And he'll make a way out of nowhere. We are perplexed. Do you understand what that means? We are uncertain and in doubts as to what will become of us. Our mind are often trouble. Don't you know what I'm talking about, preachers? We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Yet we are not in despair. One thing you ought to know tonight. One thing we do know is that who holds all of tomorrow? And who is it who holds us in our hands? Well, listen to this. God is able to make a way out of nowhere. Yes, I can say that. But I want to say it a little bit further. God is able. And in God, we place all of our trust and hope. Now, you can't say that unless you mean it. And I've been saying it a long time. But one afternoon, I discovered what I'm saying. I went back to an old song. It says, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is seeking sand. So when I'm perplexed, and when I'm in doubt and fear, and I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, and you can hear me stand up and say, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. So anything else around me doesn't mean anything. When I'm in doubt, it does not bother me. When I'm perplexed, it does not bother me. When the enemies come against me, it does not bother me. When my friends are few, it does not bother me. When I'm standing by myself, it does not bother me. As long, as long, as long as I'm standing on the rock. And guess what? The rock. Is not TK. That rock is not my brother. The rock is not white. The rock is not my church. But that rock is Jesus. And who is Jesus? He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the rose of Sharon. He's my way out of no way. He's all to me. He's God all by himself. He's my rock. And some persons because of what we represent. Did you hear that? Now, children of God, you need to understand that because you represent God, it provokes hatred. We are often forsaken of friends as well as persecuted by enemies. But God has promised yes. never. Yes. You don't hear me? Yes. Never. Yes. To leave us yes. or forsake us. Yes. I like this thing because 
I'm not talking about what I learned in seminary. I'm talking about what has come out of the transcripts of my own life. We are sometimes dejected and cast out. Sometimes it seems as if our efforts are in vain. It seems as if God has turned a deaf ear to us. I wonder if I can get a witness. The, the life that we live for Christ and all that we try to do in the name of God seems to be in vain. Our spirits are low. We are lonely and alone. There appear not to be a sympathetic ear anywhere. It appears to us that the wicked are prospering all around us. We don't know which way to turn yet, he says. You may be dejected and cast down, TJ, but you're not destroyed. I wonder if I can get a witness. We continue to pray because we believe that prayer changes things. We used to sing an old hymn of the church. I was hungry, I was sick, oh, I wish I had a prayer in church. I was filled with misery. Along came Jesus, and there he rescued me. That's why no prayer changes things. Consider this, if you will. Whatever the condition of the children of God may be, they have a but not theology. Oh, you don't hear theology to cover themselves as well as others in the world. When their case is bad, yes, sometimes very bad, they said, but not, you don't hear me, as bad as it might be. There is always hope and faith in the children of God. We need to understand the misunderstanding of the Corinthians. In them we see ourselves. But I am so glad, so glad, so glad that God uses imperfect vessels for the proclamation of the gospel. If God had not used me, where would we be? If God had not used you, where would you be? God has been a mighty good God. God has been a rock in a weary land. A shelter in a time of a storm. Paul said that the Lord stopped him on Damascus Road, turned him around, and even changed his name. I wonder if I can get a witness. Jeremiah testified that he really didn't want to speak out at all. He was not willing to be a witness for the Lord against his people. He said, I feel though there's fire shut up in my bones. I got to tell somebody about how good the Lord has been. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I know a man named Jesus who died on Calvary's cross, went down to the grave one morning, but early Sunday morning, he got up with power in his hand. And in that same likeness, I got up one morning. I might have to taste death, but I know Jesus. I might have to leave this old world, but I know Jesus. I may have to cry sometimes, but I know Jesus. I may have to walk alone, but I know Jesus. I may not be able to preach like Paul, but I know Jesus. I may not be able to sing like you, but I know Jesus. And I want you to understand, you may not do all that somebody else can do, but do you know Jesus? I want to leave you with something. If you got Jesus down on the inside, you are about something. If you got Jesus and you can't pray, with me. If you got Jesus and you can't shout, you can make a difference. If Jesus is in your life, you can have a great church. If Jesus is in your life, you can have a good home. If Jesus is in your life, you can have a better community. What I'm trying to get you to see, you need Jesus. Not the preacher, not the deacon. You need Jesus.
about you. You stop sitting there finding fault and who ain't doing the job. Maybe you don't have what I'm talking about. Do you know how much energy that we give in talking about if the preacher would get up off of his do nothing and do it, we'd be a better church. Let me tell you how to paraphrase that. If Lord, you let me get up and do what I'm supposed to do, we'll be a better church. If you inspire my heart, if you take this vessel of clay and breathe your gospel in me, and if I can quit going to church and be in church, I, I can be what the Lord want me to be. You see, what I want to tell Second National is the reason why some of us are slow is because we're at church and ain't in church. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. And the reason why you're not subject to change is because you're at the gospel, not in the gospel. And I want to tell you that if you want to grow in the Lord and move to in the Christian journey, you got to let God in and self out. You got to let the self go. Let your own agenda be put down. Let the Lord have his way. And when God gets in your life, he'll make a difference no matter who you are. Let us pray. Treasures. Is that treasure in you? Is that gospel in you? If that gospel's in you, then you'll go back to your church. And you'll make a difference. You see, you won't wait for association time to talk about what you want. You go back to your churches and you'll make a difference and be what you want. Do you hear what I'm talking about? You see, some folks wait till association time to get on the power struggle. Uh oh. Woo. Hello, walls. Some wait till association says, Look, I need to preach in the association. Look, you ought to be preaching 52 weeks out of the year. What about get a witness? And the only preaching schedule you ought to worry about preaching is the preaching schedule that God got you on. Because one of these old mornings, and it may not be too long, God's going to hush your mouth. And you wish you would have proclaimed it because just as you are a watchman on the wall, if you do not warn the people, the blood is required of you. Slowfulness is not of Jesus. Hmm? They say God calls busy people. If you ain't busy for the Lord, something is wrong with your ministry. I, I declare, I declare the best way I know how. I may not get up this way no more. It does not matter with me now. And I'm not just saying that to be saying something because I, I don't care about that. It doesn't matter with me now. What does matter with me is that I know I got a home. A house not made by hands. I got a home that no man can give me. I got a home and I'm the only one that got my key. And I know that the Lord has promised me a place over there on the other side of the river. And if you don't ever see me no more, you don't have to worry about where TJ is. You just come on to Mount Zion, I declare I'll be waiting up there. It's a promise, and I'm going to cash my coupon in one day. You hear me? If you don't cash yours in, too bad. All my job is, and all your jobs, is to warn the people. And if you don't share your ministry, your church will die. You don't hear me, do you? And if you wanted a live, vibrant church, then you tap in with everybody that's in your church. And you make a partnership with the Lord. And when you do that, you be the baddest preacher going. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Father, transcend your message.